Hey heroes, welcome to another uncanny episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to contribute and vote in monthly polls, then you can sign up for an amount of your choosing over at patreon.com slash marymarvelite. The link is in the description below along with other places you can find me. This week's tale begins with a number of characters that we've talked about individually on the channel before. There's Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, who more often than not is the field leader of the Uncanny X-Men. Jean Grey, originally known as Marvel Girl, who was Scott's teammate, lover, and a mutant with powerful psionic abilities. And finally, there's Nathaniel Essex, better known as Mr. Sinister, an insane geneticist who was transformed into a superhuman by the ancient mutant Apocalypse. While he acted subserviently for a time, Sinister ultimately betrayed his master but failed to destroy him. And so he set his sights on creating a weapon, a mutant capable of killing Apocalypse. Having already taken notice of Scott Summers and Jean Grey, Sinister deduced that a genetic offspring of theirs would have the potential to be just that. His attempts to manipulate these two began before the pair had even met, back when they were both children. After their parents were abducted by aliens, Scott and his brother Alex were raised in a Nebraska orphanage that was secretly controlled by Mr. Sinister. Sinister plotted to eliminate Jean's parents and have her transferred there as well, but before he could act, she began receiving mentorship from Professor Charles Xavier, hindering his plans. Having already obtained samples of her blood and tissue, Sinister decided to simply grow a Jean Grey of his his own. This clone was artificially aged, but while genetically identical to Jean, it appeared to possess neither sentience nor mutant powers. And so after advancing the clone to adulthood, Sinister kept her alive but unconscious in a hidden lab. Meanwhile, Scott escaped from Sinister's orphanage before meeting Xavier himself, becoming the first X-Man Cyclops. Ironically, without Sinister's interference, Scott and Jean were slowly drawn to one another and eventually started a relationship. However, things took a turn when Jean was seemingly possessed by the fiery cosmic entity known as the Phoenix. As it turns out, the Phoenix actually impersonated Jean Grey while the real Jean was sealed away to recover from what would otherwise been a lethal dose of cosmic radiation. Taking a piece of her soul, the Phoenix transformed itself into a perfect duplicate of Jean, complete with memories and personality. However, things started going wrong when she was mentally manipulated by the evil mutant mastermind. This caused the entity's violent nature to bubble to the surface, transforming her into the Dark Phoenix. In this form, she destroyed the Dabari star system, killing billions of innocent aliens. These crimes were witnessed by agents of the Shi'ar Empire, sparking a conflict between them and the X-Men. In the end, the Jean Grey persona reasserted control, and the Phoenix sacrificed its mortal body to prevent its dark side from rising again. And so as far as Cyclops or anyone else on Earth knew, Jean Grey was dead. The Phoenix, of course, reincarnated as it always does and sought to return the fragment of Jean's essence that it had taken. It sent this piece back to Earth, instructing it to seek out the real Jean and awaken her. Locked onto her genetic code, it indeed found Jean still lying dormant in a hidden healing cocoon. However, it brought with it the horrible memories of the atrocities committed by the Dark Phoenix, and so Jean rejected it, remaining sealed away rather than fuse with a corrupted part of herself. As a result, this life force was drawn to Jean's genetic duplicate, the dormant clone created by Mr. Sinister. The clone awakened as Jean was meant to and was endowed with consciousness for the first time, although seemingly not with powers. It was given the memories of the Phoenix's time impersonating Jean, but any recollection of the rest of Jean's life was muddled and vague, with a few exceptions. Deciding to take advantage of this new situation, Sinister reprogrammed the clone with a set of false memories, creating a new identity for her 
her in the process. When she fully awakened, she was an airplane pilot in Alaska named Madeline Pryor, a name that Sinister had chosen in reference to her prior existence as Jean Grey. He programmed Pryor to believe that she was the sole survivor of a fiery plane crash that occurred on September 1st, the same day and time that Jean allegedly died. Not only was this used as an explanation for the holes in her memory, but served as a cover for her lingering recollection of flying, fire, and death. Not even knowing that she'd been programmed to fall in love with Scott Summers, she began working as a freight pilot for his grandparents' company, North Star Airways. And so it was only a matter of time before she met him and the other members of the Summers family who were shocked by her resemblance to Jean. Naturally, the two grew close quickly, but neither could explain why, and Scott was understandably conflicted. To his credit, he quickly admitted the truth to Madeline that she looked nearly identical to his deceased lover, and she too was taken aback by the resemblance. When Madeline asked Scott if he liked her for who she was, or just who she looked like, he answered honestly that he didn't know, but wanted to find out. He quickly found himself falling in love and soon revealed his mutant nature when she questioned him over the fact that he never removed his glasses. But even as they started a relationship, Scott couldn't shake the notion that Madeline somehow was Jean Grey. She was subsequently introduced to the other members of the X-Men when they traveled to Japan to attend Wolverine's wedding. While that ceremony never actually happened, Madeline quickly realized that there was more to Scott's life when Kitty Pride asked her to watch her pet dragon. Scott would continue to grow conflicted when he had the option to travel the stars with his space pirate father, Corsair. Despite his reservations, he ultimately decided to ask Madeline to marry him, and she agreed. Although she did deck him sometime later when he asked outright if she was the reincarnation of Jean Grey. The situation came to a head when Mastermind tricked the X-Men into believing that Madeline was the Dark Phoenix reborn in an attempt to make the heroes kill an innocent woman. That scheme ultimately failed and Scott accepted that Jean was gone and that Madeline was not her. After that incident, Scott and Madeline were married only months after their first meeting. They honeymooned in Tahiti, but their private plane was struck by lightning on the way and made a water landing in the middle of the Pacific. As a result, the newlywed couple were forced to fight off a hungry shark and a giant octopus before being on their way. And so while their life together would be far from normal, Scott wanted to make it as peaceful as possible, electing to remain on Earth with Madeline so they could focus on starting a family. Although their honeymoon was interrupted for about a week when Scott was abducted by the Beyonder to participate in the first secret war. After his return, Madeline continued working as a pilot for his grandparents' company with Scott often by her side. During one job while flying an environmental research team over the Arctic Circle, the couple encountered an unnatural storm. Those aboard survived the ensuing crash and came upon a mystical energy source called the Fire Fountain. This transformed Madeline and the research team into tall, imposing superhumans similar in appearance to the Asgardians. Madeline gained healing abilities and, dubbing herself Anodyne, was able to give the Cyclops full control of his mutant power. It was also during this adventure that Scott learned that Madeline was pregnant. However, they soon found that the source of their new abilities was created by the mischievous god Loki, and that these powers came with a price. Not only did the Fire Fountain work by draining the energy of magic users like the X-Men's allies, Snowbird and Shaman, but it also robbed those who used it of their imagination and creativity. And so Madeline and the others rejected these gifts, transforming all those affected back to normal, including Cyclops. The couple returned home to Anchorage, Alaska, but it was only a matter of time before Scott was called away on X-Men business again. Of course, it was also only a matter of time before their baby was born, and when that time drew near, Madeline traveled to the X-Mansion to be with her husband. 
Scott wanted to name their son after his father, Christopher, but when he missed the birth, Madeline subconsciously made the child's first name a reference to her own creator, Nathaniel Essex, and thus Nathan Christopher Charles Summers was born. However, they did not immediately become a happy family as Professor Xavier had left his school in the hands of his old rival, Magneto, and Cyclops felt as though he needed to stay and lead the X-Men. Not only did he expect Madeline to raise their child alone, but he assumed that she would be willing to leave her job to do so. And so when a depowered storm challenged him to a duel over who would lead the team, Cyclops accepted. Without her even realizing it, Madeline's long dormant psionic powers briefly awakened, allowing her to subconsciously affect the outcome of the fight and ensure that Cyclops lost. He returned with her to Anchorage to continue their life together, but things also continued to fall apart. The two argued regularly, with Scott often troubled by the struggles of his fellow mutants, leaving him distracted from his family's needs. Not only that, but he was quietly wistful about his old love, Jean Grey, and even admitted as much when Madeline asked him, confirming her long-held insecurities. Meanwhile, during all of this, while everyone thought she was dead, the real Jean laid unconscious in a hidden cocoon. However, that pod was eventually found by the Avengers, who brought it to the Fantastic Four before it finally opened, releasing Jean. The heroes didn't feel that they could trust the then-current X-Men while they were led by Magneto, but were still allies with the group's retired original members. Reed Richards called a Warren Worthington, the Angel, and Warren, in turn, called Scott Summers to tell him the news. Scott, however, did not tell his wife the full truth, simply that he needed to meet with Warren in New York. Madeline told him that if he left, it would be over between them, but Scott insisted that he had to go. Sure enough, Cyclops went to confirm the truth with his own eyes. Jean Grey was alive. With the original five X-Men reunited at long last, they formed a new group called X-Factor to continue helping their fellow mutants. Madeline, meanwhile, was left alone with her son, Nathan, but Jean's return would continue to have consequences for her. Mr. Sinister realized that with Jean back, his schemes were in danger of being exposed, and sought to eliminate Madeline before that could happen. To accomplish this, he purchased North Star Airways from Philip and Deborah Summers, and sent Madeline to fly cargo to San Francisco. He also mentally influenced her, forcing her to bring her young son with her for the trip. As she arrived, he sent his mutant assassins, the Marauders, to eliminate Madeline and abduct the child that he'd bred her to have. But unbeknownst to the would-be killers, Madeline used her dormant powers to survive what would have otherwise been fatal wounds. While the Marauders left with Nathan, Madeline was rushed to a San Francisco hospital as a Jane Doe. Meanwhile, Scott continued working with X-Factor without telling Jean that he was married, but eventually slipped up when he accidentally called her Maddie. Despite not having her telepathic abilities at the time, it didn't take Jean long to figure things out after that, forcing Scott to come clean. She was obviously hurt by this and suggested that Scott return to his wife and son. However, when he attempted to do so, he found the house completely empty and up for sale. Furthermore, Mr. Sinister had completely erased any evidence that Madeline Pryor had ever existed. Scott couldn't even ask his grandparents as they had left on vacation after selling their business. But he did find one thing that gave him hope, Nathan's baby rattle that had fallen behind the radiator. Not long after that, unbeknownst to Cyclops, Madeline awakened in the hospital and contacted the X-Men. 
Sinister learned that his marauders had failed, but the X-Men saved Madeline from a subsequent assassination attempt. Mind you, it was the uncanny X-Men team that came to her aid, not the X-Factor group that Cyclops and Jean were a part of. However, Scott's brother Alex was on that team, and he decided to protect Madeline. With the Marauders still gunning for her, she accompanied the X-Men as they traveled to Dallas, Texas. And she was with them when they battled a mystical entity known as the Adversary in a highly televised encounter. To defeat this foe, the Mutant Forge would need to invoke an ancient enchantment that required the sacrifice of nine lives. The X-Men agreed to offer themselves, but with only eight members present, Madeline volunteered to be the ninth. But first, she used the news coverage of the battle to get a message to Cyclops, asking him to find their son and keep him safe. And so Scott and the rest of the world watched as Madeline Pryor perished along with the X-Men. What they didn't see was that the goddess Roma furtively resurrected the nine sacrificed souls. With the world believing them dead, the X-Men relocated to the Australian outback to continue operating in secret. During this time, they were aided by the aboriginal mutant Gateway, who could create teleportational portals for them to use. Madeline stayed with the team as well, maintaining their computer systems using technology left behind by the cyborg criminals, the Reavers. But then one day, she noticed a television interview featuring Cyclops, and beside him was a woman who looked suspiciously like her. That's when she realized the full truth about why her husband had left. Jean Grey was alive. Madeline struck the screen in frustration, causing an explosion that rendered her unconscious. She dreamed of soaring through the air with angelic wings and of being with her husband and child. She was found by Gateway, who entered her dream to observe, but was repelled by the illusory Cyclops and instead watched without intervening. Then the dream turned bad as another form appeared and Cyclops pulled the wings from Madeline's back. Declaring that she was only human and not special like them, he removed her features one after the other. He took her hair, mouth, nose, and eyes, using them to restore his true love, Jean Grey, and leaving Madeline abandoned and alone. Wandering into the dreamscape, Madeline was observed as she made a choice that would forever affect her destiny. And Gateway wasn't the only one watching. You see, among the many layers of reality that run parallel with the mortal plane and the realm of dreams, there is a hellish limbo dimension, sometimes known as Other Place. Among the demonic denizens of this timeless realm, one of the most infamous was a hulking creature named Sim. In her dream, Madeline felt the sun's rays pelt down upon her, melting her featureless flesh and reforming her face. She then tripped on a demonic-looking skull and tumbled into a hitherto unseen body of water. She emerged like a weapon being cooled after its forging, and was greeted by someone she'd never met. The demon, Sin, entered her dream and brought Madeline to an island paradise. In his claws, he showed her reflections of everything she was and of what she could be. He encouraged her to give in to temptation and to indulge her darker urges, and Madeline, thinking this was merely a normal dream, accepted. However, as Sim pointed out, dreams are simply another layer of reality, and this one would be the catalyst for what Madeline would become next. She awakened and continued operating the X-Men's computer systems, filtering out any positive news regarding X-Factor in an attempt to turn the two teams against one another. After that, due to her association with the mutant team, Madeline was abducted by the Genosian government. 
During this time, Genosha was a country in which mutants had no rights and were transformed into sterile servants of the state. They were unsure of what to make of Madeline, but decided to force her to undergo the mutate process and brought in a telepath to examine her. But then, her dormant telekinetic abilities awakened again, allowing her to kill everyone in the room before the process began. She awakened in a prison cell, not remembering what she had done, but soon used her powers to escape. As she did, she saw the pods where the Genosian gene engineer artificially bred mutant children and remarked that they felt strangely familiar to her. Indeed, while Genosian technology was largely developed by the reality-displaced mutant Sugar Man, it was based on the work of Mr. Sinister. In the midst of all of this, Madeline was contacted by another demon from Limbo, Nastir. She also began seducing Scott's brother, Alex Summers, despite his relationship with the former X-Man, Polaris. Polaris at the time was possessed by the psionic entity Malice, who was also one of Mr. Sinister's marauders. Of course, Mr. Sinister also had possession of the baby, Nathan Summers, and planned to use him against Apocalypse in the future. And so Madeline made a deal with Nastir, tasking him with finding the marauders so she could take her revenge and reclaim her son. Fully embracing her dark side, her psionic abilities fully manifested, and Madeline Pryor dubbed herself the Goblin Queen. She destroyed Jean Grey's empty grave and transformed her parents, John and Elaine, into demonic servants. After that, Nastir brought the Goblin Queen and her new subjects to a secret lab hidden in a Nebraskan orphanage. There, she found not only the pod where she was created and grown, but Mr. Sinister himself. While she didn't recognize her creator, she was soon captured by him and finally learned the truth of her origins. However, she proved to be more powerful than Sinister realized and ultimately broke free once again. Nastir then returned the baby Nathan to her, and the Goblin Queen promised to ignite an inferno that would burn the world to ashes. And sure enough, Nastir had already used Nathan and other mutant infants in a ritual to open a portal to Limbo above New York. This transformed the city into a corrupted hellscape and kicked off a full-scale demonic invasion. While the portal was soon closed by a team of young mutants called the Exterminators, others continued to contend with its lingering effects and a considerable invasion force. And in the midst of all of that, Cyclops and X-Factor were shocked to learn that Madeline Pryor was still alive and by what she had become. She tormented Jean Grey by forcing her to fight her own transformed appearance. She enslaved Alex Summers, bringing him to her side and naming him her Goblin Prince. And worst of all, she planned on sacrificing her only child so that the portal to Limbo would open again permanently, hearkening the destruction of the world. To combat this grave threat, the members of X-Factor finally joined forces with the Uncanny X-Men. However, the ensuing conflict largely came down to a mental battle between Madeline Pryor and Jean Grey, exposing the secrets of the Goblin Queen's origin. When Cyclops ultimately saved Nathan from being sacrificed, an increasingly insane Madeline attempted to unleash a massive psionic explosion that would kill everyone in range, herself included, robbing Mr. Sinister of his prized child and wrenching open the gates to Limbo in the process. While the heroes managed to shield themselves and the baby Nathan from the blast, the dying Madeline made one final attempt to take Jean Grey with her, linking their minds together. However, Jean survived by taking back the piece of her soul that had caused Madeline to awaken in the first place. With Madeline's death and Nastir's defeat, the lingering effects of the Inferno began to fade, and Jean's parents were restored to normal. Scott Summers held his infant son, and despite everything, 
mourned his deceased wife while Jean Grey stayed by his side. The heroic mutants also realized that Mr. Sinister was ultimately responsible for much of their suffering, including Madeline's, and defeated him soon thereafter. Regardless, Apocalypse later discovered that Sinister had planned to use Nathan as a weapon against him and infected the infant with a techno-organic virus to prevent this. In order to save the boy's life, he was brought to the 38th century by Clan Ascani, a sisterhood dedicated to opposing Apocalypse where the incurable virus could be treated. However, he would not be without parents, and Scott and Jean later got married themselves and sent their minds into the future to raise Nathan for 12 years as Slim and Red Dayspring. Of course, Nathan would eventually grow into the grizzled, time-traveling, pouch-wearing, gun-toting freedom fighter known as Cable. And that brings us to the end of today's story, but is this truly the end of Madeline Pryor? Well, if you want to know how she eventually returned, be sure to let me know in the comments below. In the meantime, thank you all so much for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and share it on your favorite social media. As always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page, where, for only a dollar a month, you can get your name in these special thanks here, and vote in polls that help decide what topics get covered on the channel. But that is indeed all I have for you this week, and so until next time, true believers, Excelsior! Thank you.